Easter baby? Is it BB or is it BB story? Dog. Dog. And it stands for? Yes. Thank you. Our bailiff tricked our proper quarter. <laughs> right. Ron tricked you. So, all right, welcome back, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to Department One, People vs. Robert Durst. Mr. Durst is present with Mr. Chesnoff, uh, Mr. DeGarren, and uh, for the people, we have Mr. Bailey and Mr. Milius, Mr. Miata, and Mr. Lewin. All jurors and alternates have returned, and now, um, Let's see, we have the detective uh, on the witness stand. We did, Your Honor. Um, Council has agreed we are going to read um, one of the exhibits that we had not read previously into the record. He agreed we can go out of uh, interrupt, go out of order, and, and do that now before we finish the detective, if that's agreeable with the court. Fine with us, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Chesnoff. You're Appreciate that. Uh, let's, uh, let's then, uh, who'll, who'll uh, who will read this document to the jurors? And, and uh, please uh, describe this document. Yes, sir. It's a 33-page type document um, that's been previously marked for identification as People's 198. There are some handwritten notes that I will read as well, and I will, I will uh, let the jury know when I'm reading handwritten notes. Yes, yeah, and this is uh, the document, the BD, commonly known as the BD story, which was obtained from the Susan Giordano boxes, and that was stipulated too. Okay, the BD story. All right, Mr. Miata, you may uh, read this document to the jury. Thank you. Your Honor, Let's see. Uh, as let far as we're concerned, for the convenience of the court reporter, Your Honor, she doesn't need to type because it's in, it's in evidence. She does. Oh, this young lady does. Yes. Well, the, the our cart reporter will will uh, yeah. will provide that for for Mr. Durst. But uh, but as far as our our court reporter, that's uh, not necessary due to your stipulation. Thank it's you. Not stipulation. Uh, agreement. Agreement to reading it. I'm sorry. Um, not to complicate things, but there are some portions of this document um, where. Uh, the defen uh, defendant has handwritten some notes. Yes. So I don't know. Uh, oh, well, there's some handwritten notes. So I'm not sure if that gets described on the record. At some point, she may need to jump in to make some. I know there's an evidence code 356 uh, controversy, so we, we can deal with that uh, oh. later. But as far as uh, this, it's uh, ad ad admitted by stipulation, yes. right? Yes. And uh, you, you may. Uh, Proceed, and it need not be reported by our reporter. We'll refer to the document if we need to review this record. Okay, thank you. May I begin? Yes. The 90s. 52203 updated. After my wife Kathy left in February 1982, <coughs> my compulsive use of alcohol, drugs, and food changed from an infrequent problem to a daily event. In 1992, Debbie decided after one and a half years, she could not live with me and moved out. From about then, on most days, I was unable to get out of bed before noon and had become unable to accomplish anything in my family's business or to be relied on to attend business meetings called before 2 p.m. It had become apparent to me that my brother had the support of the other family members and that I was not about to work there under those conditions. In 1992, I stopped going to the Durst family office on a regular basis. The Durst family business is very local, and I had wanted to travel for 20 years. I started making investments and purchasing homes in areas I had always been interested in, Texas and Northern California. A typical day, whether in New York City, Connecticut, Dallas, San Francisco, or Trinidad, California, was pretty similar. I would get up late in the morning and spend the rest of the day doing chores and errands. Evenings are spent with my various compulsive activities. Maybe a couple times a week I would go to a bar or a movie. I would always smoke marijuana first, then eat and drink until I was sufficiently tired to fall asleep. If I had to do something such as travel to another city or see Debbie, I would have to force myself to be controlled for a day or two beforehand. If I was unable to do so, 
I would postpone my plans. When I left New York City in 1995, I told Debbie I intended to start a new life in California. During 1995, 1996, and 1997, we saw one another infrequently and did not speak regularly on the telephone. I gradually became unhappier. I went on several dates, but only because I felt I should want to. I hated to have more than a brief conversation with someone because I immediately found myself being asked, quote, what do you do, end quote. The true answer was, quote, nothing. I live off the family estate, end quote. The next question always seemed to be about wife and or children. Quote, I don't have any, end quote. I had always been comfortable telling stories, little white lies, but now I started routinely lying about career and family. In 1998, I started spending more time in New York City with my only friend, Debbie. However, this just reinforced the discomfort I felt about being the, quote, older brother who was passed over, end quote. Many times I met people I used to know. Debbie is in the real estate business, as I was, and I always wondered what was being said behind my back. Galveston, November 15, 2000 to December 6, 2000, January 27, 2001 to January 29, 2001, March 7, 2001 to March 12, 2001, March 17, 2001, to March 28, 2001, April 27, 2001, to May 17, 2001, June 14, 2001, to July 14, 2001, August 15, 2001, to September 19, 2001. During the above dates, I lived in Galveston and never used any of the devices that would allow me or the DA to confirm that I was in Galveston. I used no credit cards, wrote no checks, did not use my cell phone or charge calls to my telephone calling cards. I paid only in cash and made all telephone calls from a payphone. Further, I made no telephone calls to anyone I knew and told no one about Galveston. Except I did not write this. Right. This was written by somebody else. Oh. I never wrote this document. Please be seated, Mr. Durst. Thank you. Exception to the above. The DA knows that on August 30, 2001, I bought the 22 pistol in Pasadena. Three or four times, I bought money orders with which to pay the rent on the apartment and the cable TV. Most of them were bought at Arlen's. I have no idea on what date. The DA should know dates, money orders purchased, the date cable installed, and the name of Morris's friend in whose name it was billed to at my apartment. Tuesday, October 31st, 2000. I wake up about 11 a.m. at my apartment in New York City, call telephone service, message from sister Wendy Krieger, New York Post has called Mortimer Matz PR man for the family business. Post will do story about missing person case of my wife, Kathy Durst, who was last seen in New York on February 1st, 1982. I feel numb. Go back to bed until 3 p.m. New message from sister. New York Times also doing story. Police are reinvestigating missing person case. I telephone sister at night. She is very upset about publicity. Wendy tells me Douglas, younger brother who runs family business, wants me to talk to criminal lawyer Joel Cohen. November 1st, 2000. Numerous phone calls from lawyers, reporters, PR agents on my phone service. Wendy tells me meeting scheduled for Monday, November 6, 2000 with PR man Wendy Joel Cohen and Douglas. November 3rd, 2000. Ask Debbie to marry me. We get license. November 6, 2000. 
At meeting, Joel Cohen says his contacts say large investigation, large budget, thinks police will, would not go public if they did not expect to charge me. Told me to prepare to make bail of more than $1 million. Also, would probably have to be in custody of another person and only leave house to go to court, as was done in a recent similar case, Mr. Daniel Berenbaum, which he described. My life had gone downhill since Kathy left almost 20 years ago, but it was a missing persons case. Arrest me, jail, bait, bail. I was shocked and scared. November 7th through 9th, 2000. I knew I would rather die than face the possibility of jail. I had been in jail briefly in Tijuana, Mexico 30 years ago, and I knew a couple people who had been to prison in America. I started figuring out, quote, how, end quote, and quote, where, end quote, to hide, and started withdrawing cash from bank. Had my estate lawyer, Alan Rothfield, redraft my will and prepare power of attorney so my best friend, Deborah Cheriton, could get access to my money, handle my affairs, etc. November 10, 2000, police go to Douglas's house. Joel Cohen says police must have interviewed all witnesses who would testify against me, and now, since they have gone public, are seeking to interview my witnesses. November 11, 2000, front page story, New York Post, New York Times, Quote from police and DA Janine Pirro. Joel Cohen says he has never seen a situation where the DA gave quotes to newspaper prior to arrest and police will probably act soon. I decided to leave. I had decided the town of Galveston in Texas is where I would go. I had mulled over what I would have to do and not do to not be recognized or found out. I had worn a beard periodically over the years and knew that would not disguise me. I decided to disguise myself as a woman. I am small boned and I do not have a heavy beard. However, I knew my voice would give me away. Hence, I would not be able to speak. Other things I realized I could not do were use my checking accounts or credit cards, telephone, anyone, telephone anyone I knew or use my car while I was in Galveston. November 12, 2000. <coughs> Front page story, all four New York City newspapers. November 13, 2000, fly to Dallas. Buy lipstick, blouse, jacket, and purse. Write on three by five card, quote, I am mute, end quote. Pack car, send suicide letter to Alan Rothfield. November 15, 2000, drive to Galveston, put on disguise, buy a newspaper, telephone real estate advertisements. Klaus Dillman answers phone at one of them. I tell him I have a mute sister-in-law who saw advertisement and wants to rent apartment. Klaus says building has no handicapped facilities. I say all she cannot do is speak, otherwise is perfectly able-bodied. After more discussion, he suggests we meet at apartment. I tell him Dorothy Siner, sister-in-law, does things for herself and will go to apartment in 30 minutes. I meet Klaus with much trepidation, but could tell immediately that disguise worked great. I spent hour at apartment. Klaus is friendly and talkative. I write brief responses. He prepares lease. I sign, give cash. He gives keys, we both leave. I return ecstatic and unpack car. That night, I sleep on living room floor after going to Walmart primarily to get TV and Kroger. November 16, 2000, drive to Baton Rouge, leave car and take Greyhound back to Houston slash Galveston. November 17, 2000, could not turn on utilities without social security number. Asked Klaus to leave in his name. Rosenberg Library, internet, lots, articles, no charges. November 18, 2000, bought furniture at Star Furniture. On my way out of building in early evening, 
door to apartment, a cross hall opens, and man comes out. He asked me not to turn on hall light because it is on his meter. I flash mute card and he acts nervous. Several hours later on my way back to apartment, I see a liquor store on 23, 23th Street off Seawall, Economy Liquor. I go in and my neighbor comes in several minutes later as I am paying. He nods and, and says he likes Jack Daniels, which I am buying too. November 15th through December 6th, wig. From November 15th when I arrived in Galveston, I wore the women's disguise whenever I left the apartment until about November 25th when I started jogging without it and going without it in the evening for walks. I continued to wear it during the day except for jogging and in the evening if I was going into a building, library, bar, store, etc. until I left Galveston on Greyhound on December 6. Three people saw and communicated with a mute blonde woman more than once. A. Morris, with whom I exchanged pleasantries whenever we met at 2213 Avenue K. B. Lady in computer room at Rosenberg Library. C. Jeff, the proprietor of the E Street Coffee House. I gradually came to hate wearing the wig. It itched, it got in my eyes, unless it was on tight, which made my head sweat. It moved. I went to a bar a couple times near the post office. On one of these occasions, while lighting a cigarette, several hairs got in the flame and burned my forehead. I jumped up. An equally big problem was remembering that I was a mute woman. One time at Rosenberg Library, I went to the restroom to urinate. I walked into the men's room where a man was using the urinal, so I went past him to the stall, urinated, walked back past him to the sink to wash my hands, saw a blonde woman in the mirror, peeked at man who was staring at me transfixed. To use computer room at the library, you had to sign in on a pad of paper as you walked past desk where employees sat. Employee was almost always same friendly black lady. First couple of times I went there, I flashed mute card, then she came to recognize me and would say hi and point out a computer. I would nod and smile. This was during the Bush Gore election fiasco. And one day she came over to me while I was seated at machine reading New York Times and commented about the article I was reading. I turned toward her and proceeded to respond for a couple sentences until I saw the shocked look on her face. Morris frequently had 20 minute conversations with this lady when he went to computer room. Early December, pay Morris and friend of his $200 each at Dairy Queen to get cable installed in my apartment. December 6, 2000, Galveston bus to Houston, 6 p.m. Greyhound, from Houston to, to NYC. December 8, 2000, 6 a.m., arrive in, in New York City on Greyhound. Call answering service, many messages, Lawyer, sister, Debbie, media, nothing from police. Lawyer refer to media, but not police. Police not charging me yet. I can stay in New York City, yippee. Between December 8, 2000 and December 19, 2000. Divide time between New York City apartment and Connecticut house. On Monday, December 11th, Debbie and I get married in AM and I meet with Joel Cohen in the afternoon. Cohen is angry that I did not return his calls and I had refused to tell him where, when I will next go into hiding or where I hid. Joel Cohen tells me that if he is contacted by police and he has to tell them that he cannot locate me, it will make getting out on bail less likely. Cohen also says that it is much more difficult to prepare for trial if a client is in jail. Also, being in jail makes it harder for a client to be at his best during trial. In 1982, the tone of the publicity was of a scandal about a rich schmuck who had a terrible marriage. People did not distance themselves from me because of it. In 2000, I was a murderer who everyone disliked. My dog sees me in lobby of the building 
and in front of several people and the doorman tells me my mother is, my, quote, my mother said not to talk to you, end quote. I telephone own, owner of large estate next door to my house in Connecticut and ask her if one of the employees could clean my house as we had done in the past. She said I should make other arrangements. However, the above type of incidents and wondering what was being said behind my back were nothing compared to the fear I experienced whenever I answered the telephone. Is it the police? Is it Joel Cohen telling me that I will have to go to jail? I stopped answering the telephone and let all my calls go to my answering service. Then I feared calling the answering service. December 19, 2000, fly to Eureka, California. December 20, 21, 22, 2000, Eureka, Garbersville, Trinidad. December 23rd, 2000, fly to New York City. Remainder of December 2000 through January 5th, 2001, in Connecticut. January 6, 2001, go to Palm Beach. January 9th, 2001, messages on service from Julie Baumgold and Nick Chavis, Nick Chavin, that Susan Berman, our mutual friend who lives in Los Angeles, was murdered in her home on Christmas Eve. There is a message from Joel Cohen that newspapers will report that New York friend was murdered. I promptly returned to New York City. About this time, I received a phone call from an autom automobile repair company in Baton Rouge that my, quote, stolen, unquote, car had been brought to them to be repaired and that the car would take one month to repair. January 26, 2001, flew to Dallas, rented car, and drove to Galveston, where I stayed until January 30. Hated wig. Having a car, which I did not have when I was in Galveston in December, made me appreciate how little it is. How few, few places there were I would feel comfortable doing the things I enjoy, library, coffee house, bookstore, movie theater, bar for those over 30. Realized that I could not hide in Galveston without wig. I need a bigger place to hide where I would only need to wear the wig infrequently. Over weekend saw more several times. January 30, 2001, returned to Dallas. January 31, 2001, flew to Los Angeles to attend a memorial for my friend Susan Berman. When I arrived in Los Angeles, I received a message from Joel Cohen that he had been told by a media source that I was going to the memorial service, and if I wanted him to represent me, I would have to stop getting in the media as we had discussed. I called him back, and he said numerous media entities would cover the event. I did not attend the memorial. February 1, 2001, flew back to New York City and stayed in the New York City area, primarily at my house in Connecticut, until March second when I flew to Dallas. In February, the Honda dealer in Baton Rouge, Louisiana telephoned to say my car was ready. During January and February, about every two weeks, there was a media story about me. People in New York Magazine and several brief pieces on the TV talk shows. The Westchester DA was always featured, but she always evaded the question of when will something happen in the Durst case. I began to agree with my wife Debbie and friend Stuart Altman that she knew I was innocent but could not resist using me in her publicity campaign to seek higher office. However, I still felt I needed a place to hide. In November 2000, New Orleans was one of the places I had rejected in favor of Galveston. I decided I would drive to New Orleans from Baton Rouge after picking up my Honda. I would bring the woman's disguise and attempt to rent an apartment as I had done in Galveston. I had hired an aerial photographer, Jim Cords, to take pictures of my wife's house in Bridgehampton. I told him I needed his security, social security number for my accountant. I planned on using his name and social security number to turn on utilities after my experience in Galveston. 
I made plans to go to Baton Rouge, airplane reservation, Dallas to Baton Rouge, and hotel in New Orleans. I also called two acquaintances who lived in New Orleans I had not seen in many years. I told them when I was going to New Orleans and both suggested I call when I arrived. March 2nd, 2001, I flew to Dallas. March 7th, 2001, rented car and I drove to Galveston. When I was carrying suitcase into apartment, Morris came out of his apartment, asked where a woman was, said he had not seen her, etc. I replied that I was her friend and that I would be using apartment while she was away. March 9, 2001, on Friday evening, I was watching Wall Street Week on PBS and Morris knocked on the door and asked if he can watch. He stayed several hours and talked almost incessantly. He criticized conditions of apartment and talked about recent arguments he had had with Mr. Klaus Dillman. Seemingly, he sent a letter to arrange time for Klaus to meet at apartment and look at unacceptable conditions with Morris. Klaus had refused to meet. Morris parenthetical called me Mo, asked my opinion about apartment. I said, for $300 a month, it was okay, except that the linoleum in the kitchen slash bathroom was pretty bad. Morris immediately took me next door to show me how he had covered his kitchen slash bathroom floor with quote, real, end quote, drop cloth, which he bought at a nearby hardware store for $12. Morris's apartment was almost empty but I was most surprised to see no TV, radio, or clock in Morris's apartment. He raved about this hardware store which had an enormous variety of items at good prices and good quality and it was always crowded with tradesmen, not like new hardware stores. He insisted I pick a time to go to it tomorrow. March 10, 2001. Saturday, March 10th at noon, he picked me up and we went to 21st Street at Broadway. This was Chalmers Hardware Store, which was to become our, quote, neighborhood shopping center, end quote. He showed me the, quote, real, end quote, drop cloth, which I bought along with some other things. I left shortly, and since he had struck up a conversation with some people, he said he would come to my apartment later and quote, install, and quote, the drop cloth in my kitchen, which he did. Early that evening, I drove to Walmart and bought a microwave oven. I thought I saw Morris in the store. Then I drove to Hastings, and after about an hour, Morris came over and sat near me. I was home watching TV about an hour later when Morris knocked at the door. I invited him in and told him to get one of those wooden chairs to sit on but not to sit on the bed as he had done the previous evening. I offered him some Jack Daniels, which I was drinking, and he accepted. I showed him where the plastic cups in the kitchen were. He pulled his wooden chair up to the side of the round wooden table at which I was sitting in the desk chair. At some point, he asked if he can change the channel with a remote, and shortly later, if I wanted more ice, and if he can get some peanuts from the kitchen. Morris. In the future, on a typical day in Galveston, Morris would knock on door in AM if he heard TV. I would usually let him in. We would watch AM talk shows. We would then meet at E Street Coffee House. He would walk, I would jog or ride bicycle. On the way, each of us would frequently go to the Tremont Hotel and take a Wall Street Journal from the lobby. Afterwards, we would either go to apartment and then go to library or vice versa. We would discuss meeting later and whoever left first would knock on the other's door. We would confirm that we might meet at a place an approximate time. Both of us wanted to not feel committed and Morris refused to wear a watch. In the evening, we would eat, drink, and watch TV, mostly PBS, news, and business. Periodically, we would go out to the Dairy Queen, etc., or just for a walk, and I would frequently smoke marijuana. The places we usually met were East Beach, the library, the movie theater, Hastings, Kroger, or the Poop Deck Bar. 
On Friday evenings, B'nai Israel Temple, we were both Jewish. On Fridays, we would always read Galveston Daily News and look for things going on in Galveston, sporting events, concerts, art night, etc., to meet at. On Saturday and Sunday, we would frequently go to an open house at a house for sale. Morris always carried several grocery bags with a bunch of reading glasses, a book, clothing. I would carry a knapsack with a book, pen, a notebook, clothes, radio, glasses, etc. We had very similar interests, business, real estate, stock market, politics. We were also in a similar situation. No family, difficulty making friends, loners, retired. In the evening, we would eat, drink, and watch TV in my apartment. Morris in charge of remote and kitchen. We watched PBS, news, business, and documentaries. Periodically, we would go out to the Dairy Queen or Eckerd's, etc., or just for a walk. I would smoke marijuana frequently, and he sometimes had a little. Morris was extremely talkative, opinionated, and assertive. Mon Monday, March 12, I drove to Dallas. Tuesday, March 13, I flew to Baton Rouge as I had planned. I picked up my Honda at the Honda Service Center, drove to New Orleans, and checked into Omni Royal Orleans. During next three days, I rented apartment just as I had in Galveston. My criteria for the apartment was that it be just as good as the one in Galveston, near the bus, and was entered from the outside as opposed to a hall shared by other tenants. Saturday, March 17, I checked out of Omni Royal Orleans and drove to Galveston. Over next week, Morris visited several times, and we went to East Street Coffee House in Hastings. Before I left, I told Morris he could watch TV in my apartment while I was, I was away and gave him the key. He acted overwhelmed. Later, he showed me where he hid an extra key to his apartment in a baggie under the house. He said he would put my key with his where I can get it if I was ever locked out. Wednesday, March 28th. I drive to da Dallas and tell manager of apartment at 311 Wilburn, Wilborn Street that I will move out at the end of April. Friday, March 30. I fly to Los Angeles, pick up friend as we had planned, drive to Palm Springs where we stay at Merv Griffin Resort until Sunday, April 1, when we drive back to Los Angeles. Tuesday, April 3. I fly to San Francisco and stay at Mandarin Oriental Hotel until Friday, April 6, when I fly to Eureka. I meet John Sanger and Mike Yoshida at 52 Telegraph Place. All approvals are in place and they want to start construction. I tell them I'm reconsidering my plans to spend time in San Francisco. Saturday, April 7. I fly to New York City where I stay until Friday, April 20. Friday, April 20, I fly to Dallas, give up apartment. Friday, April 27, I drive to Galveston. Thursday, May 17, I drove to Dallas, where I stayed at the Adams Mark Hotel until Saturday, May 19, where I moved to Le Meridian Hotel until Sunday, May 20. When I moved to the mansion on Turtle Creek, until Monday, May 21st, when I flew to New York City. May 21st to June 11th, New York City area. Monday, June 11th, I flew to Dallas where I stayed at the Adolphus Hotel until Thursday, June 14, when I drove to Galveston. June 14 to July 14. Morris and I had discussed guns and shooting a number of times. I had told him that I went to a shooting range in Houston and had invited him to join me. He said he did not like shooting ranges and told me there was a place, Pelican Island, where people went to shoot early in AM. He said it was very far from any buildings or people. 
Also, there was a 20-foot high dirt backstop to stop the bullet. A week or so later, we drove to Pelican Island at dawn, and just before Seawolf Park, we turned left onto a dirt road and stopped near some out-of-use telephone poles. I took my 9mm pistol from the tool compartment at the back of my Honda. He said he thought I had a 22, but had shot 9mm. He shot too quickly. He was not used to the kickback, and the gun kept jamming. After shooting a couple of magazines, we left. I told him the next time I went shooting in Houston, I would buy a 22. Saturday, July 14, I drove to Dallas where I stayed at the Hotel Crescent Court until Tuesday, July 17, when I flew to New York City. Tuesday, July 17 to Monday, August 13, New York City area. Monday, August 13th. On Monday, August 13th, I flew to Dallas where I stayed at the Hotel Crescent Court until Wednesday, August 15th when I drove to Galveston. August 15th to October 2nd, Galveston area. In handwritten notes, decided to buy a house in Galveston. Morris in apartment watching TV when I arrived goes to his apartment and gets eviction notice from Klaus, real angry. Morris goes to Klaus Dillman's house and yells at children. August 30, I buy target shooting 22 pistol in Pasadena. And then a handwritten note says Carter's Country Gun Store. September 1, 2001. Over the next two weeks, we shoot 22 about every other day. Also, I drive all over island looking for house for sale and Morris meets me frequently. September 11, 2001, Tuesday. Morris extremely agitated and then in handwritten notes, World Trade Center. I wanted to call wife and decided that this was as good a time as any to start using my ID and tell Debbie where I had been going. Evening. Take messages from voicemail. Return calls to wife and Joel Cohen. For the first time, I make a phone call. Sorry, for the first time, I made a phone call from Houston slash Galveston area to someone I knew. Prior to then, the nearest place I had telephoned someone I knew was from Dallas. Debbie was very upset, had no idea what would happen next. Were we at war? Would everyone leave New York? New, would everyone leave NYC? Told her I was in Galveston. She said she had heard of that. September 14th, 2001. Morris asked me to call Klaus Dillman and tell him I have a friend looking for an apartment and ask if anything available in our building. This would let him know if Klaus Dillman intends to kick him out. I call Klaus Dillman from payphone as Morris listens in. Klaus Dillman says not available, but he describes several nearby vacancies. I then ask if Klaus Dillman expects anything in the near future. Klaus Dillman says he never knows what the, quote, old man, end quote, referring to Morris, is going to do. September 16th, 2001. And there's a handwritten note that says, moved most of belongings out of apartment. Call sister who tells me wedding is still on. Am I coming? When I answer, quote, yes, end quote, she seems very happy. They almost canceled it. Half of people who were coming had canceled after 9-11. I drove to mall and shopped for a suit that could be ready in a week. September 17, 2001. Morris shoots eviction, eviction notice envelope during evening news. September 19, 2001. Wednesday. On drive to Dallas, and Dallas is crossed out and handwritten as Houston, had difficulty reading exit signs from I-45, realized I needed to see an eye doctor and get new eyeglass prescription. Check in Four Seasons Hotel, drink, bar, room service, pig out all evening, 
call mail, zillion messages, wife, sister, Altman, Joel Cohen, call Brooks Brothers and get suit delivered. September 20, 2001, Thursday. AM, Four Seasons, call escort, drive to Galveston, Bank of America, $9,500, call eye doctor. Morris and I look at several houses in evening back to Four Seasons, pig out and room service. September 21st, 2001, Friday. Drive to Galveston, Bank of America, $9,500. Buy a Western shirt, and there's a handwritten note that I can't make out. Drive to Swinging Door in Sugarland for party for wedding guests. Stay briefly. As I drove from Swinging Door, I repeatedly got lost getting to Route 59. I had to stop car to read FM street signs. Made several U-turn return, stopped by Lady Cop. Returned to Four Seasons drink at bar and room service. September 22nd, 2001. Telephone IMDs. Drive to Galveston, go to eye doctor in Walmart, have eyes tested and get new prescription, go to wedding at St. Regis, return to Four Seasons. September 23rd, 2001, Sunday. Check out Four Seasons, dinner with Wendy, family, and friends. Drive to Galveston, check in San Louis. September 24th, 2001, Monday. Morris shoots in pantry. Bank of America, $9,500. And there's a handwritten note, drive to Temple, jog to apartment, Morris in apartment, Morris had extra key. Second time this happened, Morris had gun. Bob peed on himself. I took extra key, threw Morris out. Bob hid gun in broiler compartment of stove. Now back to the type section. Broadway eye doctor, order new glasses for Walmart eye doctor prescription. Drink at bar and room service, food and liquor. September 25th, 2001, Tuesday. There's a handwritten note, looked at houses. Back to the type portion. Bank of America, $9,500. Beer at bar and room service, food and liquor. September 26, 2001, Wednesday. A handwritten note, looked at houses. Back to the type portion, picked up glasses, Broadway eye doctor, beer at bar. September 27, 2001, Thursday. There's a handwritten note that says same. And then back to the type part, room service, food, and beer. September 28, 2001, Friday. Drive to Temple and take driver's license. Bank of America debit cards, two checks, apartment key, jog to apartment where I arrive at 6 a.m. I hear TV, and then there's a, a handwritten notes, upset, then worried. Now back to the type part, Morris at table, go to oven, no gun. And there's a handwritten note, then scared. And then typed again, Morris removes gun from under yellow jacket, brief struggle, shot up to Henrique's apartment, out to Charlie's payphone, woman and child and man. I see wheelchair, ladies wheelchair, stop at one of the houses between Charlie and 2213 Avenue K. Morris eyes open, blood, mouth, nose, ear, small puddle, not breathing, feels dead, and dead is bolded and underlined. Held dog while put to sleep, an old man at girlfriend's house in Claremont, California. Sat on bed. What do? Police, my gun, my kitchen, 
I rent dressed as woman and used an alias. I am me, capital M-E. And that's crossed out in handwritten note. Walk around neighborhood, return to apartment, puddle of blood in kitchen, leave right away. See Hispanic lady who lives upstairs. She gives me funny look, says something to me. Walk on seawall, Bank of America, $9,500. Chalmers, about 12 p.m. for trash bags and drop cloth to cover Morris. Morris usually kept the key to his apartment on a string around his neck. After seeing it there, I covered him with a drop cloth, got the spare key from his baggy underbuilding. I wanted to telephone Morris's sister and sister-in-law. While looking for Morris's list of addresses, find partly prepared check for October rent. If rent is not paid by Monday, October 1st, Klaus would come, to get, come over to get it. He would also check out my apartment. I decided to pay Morris's rent with money order. And then there's a handwritten note that says, where was car, question mark. Back to the type portion. I got car, drove to Walmart about 4.30 p.m. for money order, too late to mail from their mailbox, drove to post office on Harborside. Returned to San Luis, spa telephone to remind me I had an appointment for haircut, which I had at 5.45. 8.45 room service, deliver, and it looks like a handwritten note that says Mario's. Delivery? Pizza. Oh, it? it says delivery. You said delivery. The, oh, delivery, um, and then the handwritten note that look, says Mario's and then back to the type portion, throw up. Offense. Mrs. Hernandez sees me at 9.30 a.m. downstairs as she goes to washing machine, tells me not to make noise. Saturday, I'm sorry, September 29, 2001, Saturday. There's a handwritten note that says Chalmers drop cloth and trash bags, two receipts, Friday at noon, Saturday at 4 p.m. And back to the type portion. Apartment, AM. How carry Morris out of apartment? Too heavy. Seawall, Jack Daniels, marijuana. Chalmers bought bow saw. Bow saw not deep enough. Return for bigger bow saw. Could not use saw. Went back first, looked at electric saws, bought ax did it, and did it in all caps. Lift body parts into trash bags with pieces of drop cloth, finish left leg. Torso barely fits in the garbage bag, stuff into my biggest suitcase. Get bucket, cleaning fluid from laundry room, throw buckets of water, mop with throw cloth, take repeated showers. About 4 p.m., run out of throw cloth. And then there's a handwritten note next to it that says, what time? And back to the type part. Back to Chalmers for drop cloth, trash bags, knife to cut throw cloth, load about 12 trash bags into Honda. Drive to San Luis and stay until about 12 a.m. Drive to apartment and take brown folder from Morris's apartment where he kept documents, personal items, addresses, birth certificate, will, license, other ID, medical reports, letters, notebook, and writings, which I planned on sending to sister or sister-in-law someday. I also removed his clothes. So I also removed his clothes, prescription pills, etc., bag, so it would appear to Klaus that he had moved. Then I went to my apartment and got marijuana from freezer. Drove east to Seawall, to road that connects to east end of Harborside. Drove along Harborside, stopping about six times at places where it appeared that I can get the car close to, the, to water. Water was accessible and not visible from Harborside. Each time I stopped, the fence blocked access to water, except that parking lot of restaurant, but too visible. Eventually came to 77th, which I followed 
through a small neighborhood until it dead ended at a pier. I backed the car up and one by one carried the bags and suitcase to end of pier and dropped into the water. Everything sunk immediately. I drove back to San Luis. Offense report. Miss Enriquez hears noise at 8.30 a.m., doesn't know from where. There's a note, handwritten note that says Sep, Sep 29th. And then back to the type part, um, in brackets, Lori Kusick. Quote, man similar to me, but six foot tall, asks if police in area at night. She says yes, will give ticket for trespassing. Also says, does not understand why I go to her yard and ask her when there are other people fishing, I could ask, end quote. Does not have time of day. On October 14th, identified me from photo lineup. This is four days after my picture started appearing on front page of Galveston Daily News. Picture used by newspaper was of me being booked. Is this, is this the same picture used in the photo lineup, question mark? September 30, 2001, Sunday. I could not sleep. Kept imagining that I had left the garbage bag at end of road where car was parked. At 9 a.m., I drove to 77th Street, parked around corner from pier, <coughs> no one around. I walked toward dead end. As I approached, I was shocked to see a garbage bag bobbing in the water, then several others and the suitcase. I immediately left, drove to apartment, walked around, did not go in. At noon, I returned to 77th Street and parked just off Harborside. I walked to dead end, saw no one around, saw a quote, real estate for sale, end quote, sign on land leading to pier. This time, I walked out onto the pier and counted six garbage bags, several plainly floating, others floating several inches below the surface. The torso in a garbage bag had come out of the suitcase. The suitcase with the lid back was floating near the land. The previous fear I felt turned to a panic as I realized my fingerprints would be all over. I saw a pickup truck head for dead end. I walked quickly away, but the man got out of the truck, approached me, and asked if I was interested in, quote, land for sale, end quote. I said no. I walked back past my car and along Harborside and returned to dead end around 3 p.m. I saw several garbage bags floating, but not one with a torso or suitcase until I looked straight down. The torso out of the garbage bag was floating chest up. The leg stumps were gray and the testicles and penis were bobbing in the water. I walked to the car, drove to the apartment, went in and sat in the desk chair until 8 or 9 p.m. I drove to 77th Street, parked, walked the street leading to the dead end, saw police cars, turned around, drove to San Luis, and took several Halcyon. October 1, 2001, Monday. I got up around 4 a.m. knowing that I had to leave Galveston and never come back. Went for last run on seawall, drove to where cash was hidden, and then handwritten, it says, under St. Joseph's Church, and back to the type portion, drove to the apartment to get marijuana from freezer, and Morris's personal items to send to sister or sister-in-law. I became frantic when I realized they were not in apartment and remembered I had taken them previously to car. I ran out to the car, but they were not there. I drove back to San Luis, telephoned Debbie to tell her I was not flying to New York City that day. I wanted to tell her I never would. I canceled airplane and hotel reservations and checked out of St. Louis, uh, San Louis. It says, I'm lonesome, and that's crossed out in, uh, in pen. I'm thinking I would live the rest of my life in hiding. I drove to E Street Coffee House, had several espressos, walked around town for last time. I walked to Broadway Eye Doctor, gave them bifocals they had put Walmart prescription in, which was incorrect. They gave me a new eye exam, said bifocals would be ready in two days. I convinced myself that Morris belong Morris's belongings 
had to be in his apartment and my marijuana had to be in my freezer that I must have been dreaming this AM. Went back to the apartment to get them. They were not there. I drove to New Orleans. October 2nd, 2001, Tuesday. Bought furniture. October 3rd, 2001, Wednesday. When I opened the door of the car, it stank of marijuana. Then I figured out I had put marijuana and Morris's things in hidden storage area under a lid in back of Honda. I drove to rural area about one hour from New Orleans to find a place to hide car. Found old logging trail, but there were a couple tree trunks on trail. I will have to cut and move. And then newspaper report Morris Black, and that's crossed out with handwriting. October 5, 2001, Friday. Frerit Hardware near apartment. I bought a bow saw to cut logs on logging trails. October 2 to 7. Spent almost all time in the apartment, drunk and stoned. S scared to go out. Wear a wig. Always looking around. I decide I cannot live in hiding and return to Galveston and hire a lawyer. October 8, 2001, Monday. Drive to Galveston. Tried to check in two motels, but they asked for ID. Stayed at Holiday Inn, which did not ask. Pig out, and then in handwritten notes, in handwritten notes it says offense report. And then back to the typed portion, it says cops find room, waste paper basket full of ice cream cartons and cookies. October 9, 2001, Tuesday. The handwritten note that says who. The type portion, call lawyer, call eye doctor. Prior to leaving motel, I put my laundry, which had been in Honda for several days, in their washing machine. Bracket, offense report. Get glasses, get arrested, not read rights. Detective acts mockingly towards me on way to police department. Asked if cooperate, said no. At police department, asked if I will give blood, etc., said no. Took me to see judge. Judge asked why I won't give blood, etc. I say, Jessica told me. Judge asked about Jessica, then signs order. We leave. At this time, I'm asked if rights read. I say no. Read rights. Drive to mainland. Nurses take, nurse takes blood, etc., back to Galveston and booked. I answer most questions incorrectly. Says bail $250,000. I'm amazed. Takes shoes and glasses. I say can't see without glasses and when will I get shoes? He says, evidence. Quote, we will get you shoes. What size are you? End quote. I knew I would not get shoes in the tank. I'm sorry? He read I knew. He knew. Oh, he knew. I would not get shoes in tank. Customary to move inmates who, and then there's a, there's a handwritten they, expect to stay, and then that's crossed out and the word keep is written, longer than one day to Galveston County Jail. So it reads, customary to move inmates who they expect to keep longer than one day to Galveston County Jail. Telephone Debbie at office, she was scared started to cry, bank closed, would not be able to bail until the morning. Asked to see yellow pages, torn in middle at quote attorneys, end quote listing at beginning of book. Asked for a list of bail bond people, taped to wall, four of five numbers disconnected, last quote no answer, end quote. Called Debbie Holder. She hired bail bondsmen. That evening, other four inmates given clothes and taken, back, taken to back where there were bunks, mattresses, bedding, only I left in tank. October 10, 2001, Wednesday. I am told that I am in paper and on TV. Call Debbie, money to be wired. She is so scared. At noon, taken to county jail, 
need additional $50,000 bail for marijuana. Lawyer is in jail. Lawyer is at jail. Have been trying to find me at both jails. I tell him to call Debbie and get $50,000 more. He says $50,000 for misdemeanor is unheard of. 4 p.m. bail bondsman shows up, go to his office, still no shoes. Lawyer at bail bondsman's office, borrow all cash lawyer and bail bondsman, borrow all cash lawyer and bail bondsman have about $200. Bail bondsman agrees to take $1,000 out of bank in the morning. I had seen a TV story about Greyhound, which was now checking ID at some locations. I needed the cash in case I had to take taxis to New Orleans. In my apartment in New Orleans, I had a gun to kill myself with and cash I had been taking out of the banks. And then there's a handwritten note, $450,000. Back to the type portion. Last year, which I wanted to send to Debbie. They showed me newspaper article. Both acted nervous dealing with me. Bondsman drives to motel near Walmart, uses credit card to rent room, I use room in his name. Call Debbie, tell her I cannot live in jail and I cannot live in hiding. She can't speak without crying. Go to Walmart and buy shoes and clothes. To my great shock, I go right to sleep. October 11, 2001, Thursday. Go to bail bond offices as agreed. He had gotten $1,000. I told Galveston lawyer and bail bondsman I would call the next day. I had not told them I was leaving Galveston. Take taxi to Houston Greyhound office. Ticket seller asks for ID. I leave and take taxi to Beaumont where I'm able to buy a ticket without ID. All day long, I kept thinking, I want to see the places I knew as a child one last time. I could not take the plane, train, or Greyhound. October 12, 2001, Friday. Call lawyer, Mark Kelly, tells me bail would be revoked if I did not have a Texas address. That it would be best if I could rent an apartment at my old address in Dallas. Called the rental office in Dallas, gave them my telephone number in New Orleans. They never called back. I looked up used car dealers in Yellow Pages. Telephone two of them and say I'm paying with cash. Both, says, both say it takes two days to register car and get insurance and I need to bring my driver's license. I make up story about towing car home and not using it for several months. Both say that is okay, but I still need to bring driver's license. I look up car rental agents. Some advertise no credit card needed. I call several and all of them say I need to bring my driver's license. October 13, 2001, Saturday. Rent van, call bondsman on sale. October 14, 2001, Sunday. Call Debbie, Mark Kelly, pack van, two suitcases, throw out other personal items, take four Bank of America $9,500 envelopes. October 15, 2001, Monday. Take money to shipping store in a shoulder bag, cover with some clothes, ask to FedEx to Debbie, then drive to Mobile, Alabama. October 16, 2001, Tuesday. Rent a wreck. October 18 through 23rd, 2001, Thursday to Tuesday. Drive to New York. Stop in West Virginia. Diane Wynn. And that's the conclusion of the document. Let's uh, take a recess then for. Let's take a recess. Ladies and gentlemen, do not converse among yourselves or with anyone else on any subject connected with this case. Do not form or express any opinion on this case. 1035 will resume. John? Yes. Yes? Oh. Are we already out for No, we can be on the record if you have an issue. Um, I believe, uh, spoke with Mr. Chesnoff this morning, I believe the defense has no objection to substituting the redacted version for People's 198, is that right? Or you weren't going to, maybe I misspoke. Yes. 
Well, Your Honor, I, I advised counsel this morning that we did not read the entirety of the 33-page document, that there are portions that we have redacted. Yes. And because we did not present the entirety of the document to the jury, that we have a version of what was read to the jury that we would like to substitute for People's 198. Any objection? Oh, Your Honor. Okay, then it, uh, we'll substitute it. Thank okay, you. Thank Any, you. Anything else? All right. Um, recess.